This is an, an age of disruption, of profound revolutionary change. What we're really asking ministers is to empower the ambassadors. The only thing that you really push forth is the truth. You don't see many women represented when it comes to the decisions as to how to handle the pandemic. Hi everyone and welcome back to our Competitive Europe Summit uh, here with Politico in Brussels. Uh, thank you again for joining us in the room here and also for joining us online via the live stream. I'm Lauren Cyrulis, I'm the Cybersecurity Editor and Deputy Tech Editor at uh, Politico in Europe. And for our next session, I have the pleasure uh, to have a short interview with Anthony Greco, Chief Information Security Officer at Cisco. Cisco is also a presenting partner uh, of our Competitive Europe Summit today. Anthony is joining us via live stream. He's joining us from Raleigh, North Carolina, um, in the east coast of the United States. And you've all had your uh, break now. Uh, I hope you had your networking. I do hope you had your caffeine, but I hope Anthony had his caffeine uh, much more uh, because it is early in the morning in North Carolina. And um, I do hope he's had the chance to boil a cup of coffee before joining us. Uh, let me welcome Anthony uh, via live stream. And Anthony, let me welcome you. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining. So you did have your coffee. I have had at least one cup of coffee this morning. Thanks for asking, and it's a, it's, it's a pleasure to be with you. That's great. No, it's it's our pleasure to to have you here at our summit. Um, obviously, we're talking to you uh, from Brussels, uh, which um, is arguably the West's uh, capital most in love with regulating things including with regulating cybersecurity. And um, I'm very happy to talk to you about that because it is the, the, the area of your uh, strongest expertise. So I wanted to ask you um, from your vantage point as Chief Information Security Officer at Cisco, if you look at what you see coming out of Brussels, um, and I'm talking about the regulations and the laws that this EU executive, the European Commission, has drafted in the past couple of years and is in the process of rolling out. Um, if you look at that set of laws, which include laws regulating critical infrastructure, laws regulating internet connected devices, uh, regulating the sharing of information between industry and government, it is a broad swath of different um, different things to keep in mind if you are an industry player uh, the size of Cisco's. And um, I wanted to start there and ask you, those laws and those requirements, do they actually help you or hurt you in your daily job of protecting Cisco's networks? Yeah, the, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a perfect question. And I'll, I'll start by saying, like, in addition to protecting Cisco, I also spent quite a bit of time with our customers as well. So, in fact, I was in Europe last week uh, visiting with a, a broad range of uh, governments and customers. And so, it, for us, I think there's a couple of really critical things that, that the regulations have done, which is I think they've focused in really critical risk areas. So, first and foremost, thinking about 5G and cloud and telecoms, I think these are really important areas of risk. Uh, that need to be addressed and focused on. And in doing so, I, I think sending that signal about how important security is, is an essential uh, component to uh, uh, what the regula regulations have done uh, at this stage. When it comes to really thinking about how we defend Cisco and, and what our overall uh, kind of response is from customers, I'll, I'll say, I, I think the focus is good. I think the uh, overall uh, areas of focus uh, from a technology perspective are important. I think the one thing that does drive a, a bit of concern is when you think about a, a topic like cybersecurity and what it takes to defend Cisco, uh, for instance, we're a, a global company operating in 98 different countries around the world, cybersecurity doesn't have any borders. And, and so we are ultimately uh, uh, dependent on the critical technologies from trusted providers around the globe, data and information that needs to be fused and brought together ultimately to provide the best security capabilities 
uh, to protect our enterprise, to protect our customers. And so I, I think the thing that is really tricky about the kind of existing sets of regulations and where this topic is going globally, not just in Europe, is how to balance this uh, approach from a, a regulatory perspective of being pragmatic, making sure that you're dealing with technologies that are secure and trusted, but then also making sure that those technologies are available and that you're not eliminating essential technologies that are necessary for cybersecurity protections in the marketplace today. That, that's an interesting point. You raise, I think, a balance uh, between uh, between tr trusted partners and 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 those those that are available. Um, I wanted to ask you specifically. There's a broader um, there's a broader theme uh, that's uh, that's been um, sort of on the minds of of, of European. Uh, lawmakers in the past uh, years, which is um, the, the the theme of de-risking, uh, which is I think something you 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 touch upon when you talk about trusted providers. Uh, now, de-risking can mean many different things. In some cases, we've seen it um, being used in Europe to sort of uh, build up networks and and build up uh, cooperation with trusted partners. In other cases, we've seen it um, be in a reflex where Europe tries to do everything by themselves. Um, and I wanted to ask you, are you a fan of the de-risking strategy and narrative that's coming out of Brussels? Um, and, uh, and or do you see uh, clear dangers here? Well, so I, I, first and foremost, cybersecurity is a game of risk management. And so, so I think the idea of focusing on where there is pragmatic operational and security risks is at a, at a principal level, I think, a, a very sound way to go. I think when we start drawing uh, arbitrary borders around where technology can and can't operate and come from without understanding the overarching risks that come uh, that we're trying to address with it and understanding that and by controlling certain risks, you may be creating others. I think that's really a, a, a very specific area of concern from, from my perspective. There's always going to be a need to do things uh, and have local capabilities. And in particular instances, that's an essential part of uh, national security missions and other things along those lines. But broadly speaking, I think you know the, the, the broad issues around cybersecurity, such as how do you get the right talent? How do you have the right technologies? How do you have the right global view from a data perspective? I think are really essential to balance as we think about the overall risk management conversation around this. So, so the idea of de-risking is, is I think a very positive one, but I think we need to be very uh, pragmatic about what risks we are focused on and what the strategies are to de-risk those and understand that sometimes by de-risking certain things, you may create risks in others. Ultimately, you know, to boil it down, I'm concerned that uh, if we go broadly in, uh, in a strategy which describes very narrow, localized uh, 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 instances of capabilities and technologies as the only strategy, I think ultimately that's going to have an effect of actually creating risks in certain areas versus controlling all risks. That's an interesting point. Thank you. Um, one element I wanted to ask you uh, uh, about is supply chain security, um, in part because Cisco is obviously very integrated in the tech landscape and understands the depth of, of uh, the sector's uh, supply chains very well, uh, but also because it seems a particularly tricky issue to engage with if you're a legislator. Uh, because laws need to be uh, need to have boundaries and scope, and uh, supply chains oftentimes are much more complex and and, and interwoven uh, than what we generally can conceive. Um, so I, I I wanted to ask you um, if uh, how you feel sort of you know the the the, the set of legislation coming out of Brussels has helped. Uh, strengthen supply chain security, but also how governments can help industry a little more to actually move, uh, move forward on that part uh, specifically. Yeah, look, uh, supply chain is uh, an incredibly uh, complex topic uh, for the reasons you described, which is the interconnectivity is sometimes obvious and sometimes not obvious. And, and uh, I think the overall approach to Again, not thinking about, and I hear this often, where people think they're going to solve supply chain security. That's as going back to the previous conversation. Supply chain security is about risk management, and and so when I think about how we approach it as a company, there's really uh, three kind of fundamental things that we think through. One is identifying and understanding who our supply chain partners are, and then 
what that web of interconnectivity is uh, amongst them. Uh, the second thing is helping make sure that we take a pragmatic risk-based approach with each of those suppliers to understand and control the risk that they create to us and to potentially to our customers. Not all suppliers, not all partners are the same. And so I go back to, again, a very pragmatic risk-based approach. To, to use a, a very simple example, when, when we build a piece of hardware, the, the, the provider of the sheet metal that goes around the hardware is less important from a risk perspective than uh, maybe a provider of uh, integrated circuits, uh, as an example. And then finally, I, the other thing that is, uh, I think, oftentimes missed in the supply chain security conversation is we have to partner with our supply chain uh, overall. This is not an adversarial relationship. We are codependent on one another, and we have to work together with them. So we spend a lot of time with our supply chain partners, helping make sure that they are ultimately uh, practicing the right security capabilities. They're delivering uh, and thinking about security as a part of their core business. And frankly, creating a culture of security inside of those organizations. Because I think the best thing that we can do in the supply chain security conversation is incentivize the creation and awareness of cybersecurity throughout the supply chain, because that's going to pay dividends over the long term. Thank you very much, and uh, I want to thank you for having spent the time with us this morning, your morning, um, our uh, noon, uh, our midday, um, and uh, thank you very much for this frank discussion. I very much appreciate it. Uh, if I can ask room for a short uh, round of applause for Anthony, that would be wonderful. Thank you very much. I'd like everyone to remain seated as we'll jump right into our next session, which is going to be a uh, discussion on, again, digital age, digital defense. So getting into those cybersecurity uh, topics yet again with my colleague, Antoinette Roussy, who will be moderating that discussion. Thank you very much.